Hello, config. I'm Lawrence, technical program manager on the PM team at Figma. And like many of you, this is my first in-person config. And I am blown away by the size and the energy of the crowd. Although I've spent most of my career as a software engineer and a TPM, I've always cared so much about the design of things that I'll end up in Figma files kind of messing around. And I've definitely gotten in trouble for that. Maybe some of you can relate. Maybe some of you are like, oh, no, it's that guy. <laughs> but that's why I love Figma. It just makes it so easy that you feel like you can do anything. And I love working at Figma because I get to help other people have that feeling too. So here we are, coming into the final stretch of Config 2023. Can you believe it? Make some noise if you're having a good time so far. <laughs> yeah. I hope you've learned a few new tricks, felt the spark of inspiration, and made some new friends while you've been here. I know I have. And it makes me a little sad to think that our time together is coming to an end. But don't worry, there are still a few incredible speakers that I now have the honor of introducing to the stage. Coming up, we have none other than a fellow figmate of mine, a software engineer on our editor usability team, Shirley Miao. Shirley has tons of experience working on the complicated engineering behind some of our most beloved features, like auto layout and components. Whether or not you're an engineer, you're in for a treat, as Shirley gives us an exclusive peek behind the curtains of Figma's code base. Without further ado, please welcome Shirley to the stage. Hi, I'm Shirley. I'm a software engineer here at Figma, and my talk is going to be on software as archaeology digging up the past to build for the future. To start us off, I'm going to talk about this parable called the Ship of Theseus and what it has to do with engineering. It's a myth that goes like this. Theseus was an ancient Greek king and warrior, and he built this incredible, massive ship. It had 30 oars. It was a battleship, and it was kept in excellent condition over 1,000 years. Because at any point over those 1,000 years, this ship of Theseus might have been called into battle. Now, the way that the crews who were responsible for the ship of Theseus kept it in tip-top shape was like this. Every time a piece of the ship needed replacing, they would replace it. If a piece of wood decayed, they would replace it. If a sail tore, they would replace that, and so on and so forth. And over a 1,000 years, you can imagine that none of the original pieces of that ship remained. Over a 1,000 years, every physical piece of that ship had turned over. When I heard about this parable, I found myself thinking, building software is building a ship of Theseus. But instead of swapping planks, you're swapping out lines of code. And instead of swapping sails, you're swapping out the servers that your code runs on. Instead of subbing in new sailors over time, you're changing out the engineers. And I don't think it's that much of a stretch to say, over a long period of time, maybe five years, maybe 10, you probably would have changed out every line of code, every server, and every team member from what you started out with. Now, the original quandary behind the ship of Theseus is there were two camps of philosophers, and they started to debate if every physical piece of this ship had turned over over 1,000 years, was it still the same ship? One camp thought, well, of course it was. The physical materials making up the ship have nothing to do with its identity. And the other camp of philosophers said, well, if it's not made of the same pieces, it's not the same thing. So I started thinking about this for code bases, and I realized that every single day, code bases change out from under us. You know, It's a consequence of software being intensely collaborative on any given day, you're probably merging dozens or hundreds of PRs into your code base. At any given time, there are hundreds of us building on the same shared structure. And over time, a code base evolves. In five or 10 years, it will be totally different from what you started out with. The very nature of the thing seems really different. Now, it turns out that I've been writing code at Figma over the past six years, primarily in our design editor, 
which is the oldest piece of our code base. It's about 10 years old at this point in time. And so I've seen this turnover change happen in our code base up close. In some ways, visually, Figma, the product, hasn't changed that much over time. You can see that the look and feel of the design editors from June of 2017 looks pretty much the same as what it looks like today, although our feature set is a lot richer now. But if you peek under the hood at our GitHub repository, everything has changed. Over the years, an immense amount of engineering and new engineers has completely transformed our code base. Just last week, we had 1,500 changes merged into our code base. So I found myself asking the same question as those philosophers about the ship of Theseus. Is this still the same Figma? Are we still the same team, same code base, same organization, even though all of our code and servers and engineers have changed? What I've concluded is that, like the ship of Theseus, I think that Figma does remain the same product and team, but not just because it looks the same or because it's made of similar materials or runs on similar machines. Figma is the same because we were able to hold on to some intangible core. And what I want to talk about in this talk is the type of things that make up this intangible core for engineering. I'm going to do this by talking about two popular features in the Figma uh, product. The first is going to be auto layout, and this is a tale of excavation. The second is what we know internally as the unflattening project, unflattening components, and this is a restoration of sorts. So let's get started. Let's talk about the way that auto layout has changed in Figma's code base over the years. Like I mentioned, this is a story of excavation, how a team of auto layout newcomers came to sift through the remnants of the feature code that we were left with we dusted it off, and we made it new. History lesson. Auto layout kicked off as an engineering project in 2019 and then launched a few months later. It's a feature that is super, super powerful. It allows you to create layers in your designs that automatically adjust in size and position according to their surrounding layers. And with this feature, designers can spend far less time than they used to adjusting layers pixel by pixel. Auto layout was immediately so powerful after launch that Figma launched four more versions of it in quick succession. And this is how it evolved over time. Every version of auto layout added on top of the existing functionality that already was there. It was completely additive. Nothing was ever taken out. The first version of auto layout gave us the original functionality where you could align contents inside of a Figma frame with auto layout applied and make sure that frame grew and shrank with its contents. Simple enough. The second version gave us UI improvements, a revamp of how you set auto layout. The third version gave us this super powerful new feature, fill container. You can now set this on an auto layout child, and it would grow or stretch to its container. The fourth version gave us absolute positioning and a brand new way of setting auto layout. And as of yesterday, we got the fifth version of auto layout out. And this added min and max and wrapping to auto layout. This is where I come into the story. You see, this fifth version of auto layout was the only version of auto layout that I have worked on. And I want to tell you all a little bit about how this auto layout sausage got made in the fifth version. My team, the fifth team to build on auto layout, had a straightforward goal. We wanted to add wrapping and min-max to all of these features that already existed in auto layout without taking anything away. But the problem was, my team didn't know what auto layout was. We were so new to this feature that we were building in uncharted territory. And frankly, it was pretty intimidating. We knew we had to learn a lot about this feature to even get started. To learn about auto layout, we had to dig up four prior versions of technical context from the teams that came before us. It was an excavation, an excavation of technical decisions made over the years. And as we dug, we started to find these like terms coined by our predecessors in the code base. Terms like hug, which is how we refer both in our code base and in the Figma product to a setting on a Figma frame that tells it to adjust its size to match its largest fixed child layer. OK, 
That was simple enough. So we kept on digging in our code base and in our feature set, and we found this other term, fill container. It's a bit of the opposite of hug contents. The child of an auto layout frame could now set this setting, and it would resize itself to grow and shrink with its container. And as we started to dig deeper into our code base, we realized that we hadn't been left on our own. You see, the past four teams that had worked on auto layout had given us these like trails of breadcrumbs in the form of super careful documentation and links, and incredibly thorough code comments. Frequently, we encountered more lines of comments than lines of code left for us by the authors years ago. By piecing together what we'd unearthed and what our predecessors had left for us, we began to understand the code base that we were working with. A stack to start with. We saw so many terms called stack in the code base, there are barely any mentions of the term auto layout. And we quickly realized that our predecessors had chosen the term stack to mean auto layout frame simply because it was easier to say and type out than auto layout frame. So it's really just a Figma frame with auto layout set. Once we understood what a stack was, well, it's pretty simple to understand what a stack child was. It's simply just a Figma layer nested inside of a stack. But we also noticed that it was possible for a stack to be a stack child to be a stack itself. And so we had this idea that it was possible to have stacks on stacks on stacks. <laughs> OK, another term. The code base has hundreds of references to the term primary. And we quickly realized that this referred to the direction that auto layout flows in for a given stack. If your stack is set to flow auto layout horizontally, then horizontal is the primary direction. Similarly, we, sound, we saw hundreds of references to the term counter, and we quickly realized that this referred to the opposite, the perpendicular direction that auto layout is set in for a given stack. So if a stack has horizontal set, its counter direction is vertical. And over time, as we kept on digging into the code base, my team was able to build familiarity with auto layout, both the feature and the code base. We had this indirect guidance from the original architects of auto layout, and we started to speak the same language as our code base. And this made our job so much easier. We were able to communicate with clarity with one another as a team, and it also showed up in our code. We even found signs of experiments that our predecessors had performed that hadn't panned out. But those were helpful because it told us that we didn't have to redo that same work. Our project, for instance, wasn't the first time that we had attempted wrapping in Figma. And we found a document from our predecessors that talked about the trade-offs of building a wrapping engine internally in Figma versus using Yoga, which is Meta's open source library for performing flexible layout. We also learned why they wouldn't recommend it for us here at Figma. It was simply a little bit too slow. The original architects even documented major problems that they didn't have solutions to, like this rotated text issue, which is the major way that Figma's auto layout engine differs from CSS's Flexbox. This was a decision that was made in the first release of auto layout, and it led to consequences in what we could build. Effectively, in the first release of auto layout, we decided to rotate text prior to performing layout, which is what you see up top. It turns out that for CSS, this happens in reverse. So layout happens first, and then text gets rotated. This led to downstream consequences in what we could build. But even knowing this for us was helpful, because it told us the limits of what we could build. As we built our new features, wrapping in min-max for auto layout's fifth version, my team realized that we had a responsibility to do the same thing for the teams that would come after us, the teams that would inherit our code and our bugs and our features. So like our ancients, we left records in the form of documents explaining our design decisions and tons of inline documentation and more. We wanted to give them a stable foundation to build on top of what we had. Working on Auto Layout's fifth version made me realize that software engineers aren't just archaeologists of the past, although at times that is a big part of our roles. We're also builders of the future. We excavate the context that's already there. We build on top of it, and we record what we built for future builders. 
along the same vein, the foundations of the features that we build today are the ones that we built yesterday. The feature set that we have in Figma's auto layout today is only possible, and it's a direct consequence of what was built yesterday. Finally, when I think about this documentation effort made by the past auto layout engineers, I think about the tremendous amount of thoughtfulness that it took for them to document as painstakingly as they did. I think they must have had a lot of empathy for us, the teams that would later inherit their code. They didn't have to do what they did, and in, in some cases, it probably slowed them down in development significantly. But they did, because they knew how painful learning the language of auto layout could be. I'm grateful that they were able to contribute to our understanding, and I'm glad that we were able to do the same for the next team that takes over auto layout. Great. OK, next up, how are we doing? <laughs> next up, I'm going to talk about what's known internally at Figma as the unflattening components project. And unlike auto layout, which was an excavation of sorts, this effort was a restoration. After years, the data behind Figma's popular components feature had decayed and was in desperate need of restoration. We had to restore this data so that components could be far more powerful to our users. In 2016, this feature called Team Library Components launched. It was so powerful. It allowed you to create designs as components in one file. You would push them up, and then your teammates could reuse those same designs in other files. And all the while, while you updated your designs in that first file, your teammates would receive those updates in the other files. In this way, components in their instances would forever be in sync. But not too long after this feature went out, we realized that there were some serious limitations to what could be built with components. Sometimes, instances would just get out of sync with their components, seemingly out of nowhere. It took three years, three separate attempts, and building out a fully-fledged other system in order to fully restore these components to their prior glory. And I'm going to talk to you about the story of how we did that. OK, to, to dive deeper into the story, we need to talk about flattened components, what they are and why we don't like them. Flattened components were the original type of components that Figma stored and published in our files. And the reason why they're called flattened is because every layer underneath an instance that you create does not remain an instance itself. So imagine this modal dialog up top was a component. You published it to your team library. Your teammate uh, uses this component in another file. That's the one on the bottom. Now, this instance of the modal dialog in the other file that would be an instance. It would get updates from its main component. But every single layer underneath of that layer would not remain an instance. That cancel button, the commit button, the close button, none of those would be instances. They would just be Figma frames. Those of you who have used Figma for maybe four or five years, you probably remember some of the pro painful product limitations that working with flattened components came with. But there were two main consequences. First, it was impossible to swap nested instances. So this is, on the right, what that dialog would look like uh, in your Layers panel. And you can see that all of those underlying layers, they're frames. And so you can't swap out the Close button for something that's slightly different in size or a different color. It was just impossible. The second consequence was once you detached that dialog modal template up top, you wouldn't, maintain, you wouldn't be able to maintain any of those instance connections in the underlying layers. And so you would never be able to get updates about that close button or the title or those other buttons. Another property of flattened components that we should talk about is it was infectious. A flat component was flat forever. Its instances would forever be flat. But if you combined a flat component with an unflattened good one, well, too bad. You end up with a flat component. It was, it was terrible. You can see on this screen that there were a ton of bugs that we started to get around 2017 that were a consequence of using flat components. For example, sometimes if you copy 
a main component, it would copy as a new master. And sometimes it would paste as an instance. Sometimes things would just like break out of nowhere. Now, the reason why we ended up with flattened components were it was the consequence of an early Figma engineering decision. A team of excellent engineers wrote shared components in late 2016. And in the process, they made a series of irreversible decisions. I think it would have been really hard to predict from their vantage point that these product limitations would one day feel inflexible and strange to our users. I think that something like swapping nested components just wasn't obvious at the time. So in 2017, I was part of the first team that attempted to unflatten components, that is, preserve the, those nested instance connections when you created an instance. And we attempted to do this by running an entirely client-side migration. This is a type of migration where your migration logic is fully baked into a version of the client that your users run on their devices. And crucially, what this means that, is that in order for this data migration to run, a user would have to physically go to figma.com, open up that file containing the bad flat components. At that point, we could run our migration logic, and then the components in their file would become unflattened. And we thought this would be fine. We started to write the migration logic. Things seemed to be OK. But then we soon realized that things would break down if you had your design system strewn across multiple Figma files. Say you had one file for icons and typography and a second design system file that used components of that first file that contained maybe modals or tooltips. In this case, our client-side migration would result in partially unflattened components. And if you recall from earlier, partially unflattened really means flattened. Diving a little bit deeper, in order for this client-side approach to work, we would have to have the files opened in the exact right sequence by the user. It was like we needed this precise ordering of nesting dolls, but there could be any number of nesting dolls to begin with. Let's say we had a user, and they had five design system files, each one containing progressively larger, more involved components. In this case, that user would have to first open uh, their files in the order of component dependency to end up with unflattened good components. So they would have to start at that first file containing text and colors, have our client-side migration run, open that file, publish up the changes, and then so on and so forth. They would have to pull down those changes in all of the consuming files, unflatten and publish those changes, so on and so forth. And this just wasn't a realistic expectation to have. From a component dependency perspective, the files would actually be opened and migrated randomly. Most of them would be migrated out of order, resulting in partially unflattened, flattened components. And some files would just never be open to begin with. They would never get this migration. It turns out that what we needed just wasn't possible with the technology that we had. It seemed like we were doomed to live in this flattened world forever. In 2017, we decided to table this project in favor of more pressing user requests and moved on. But in 2018, a second team picked up this project. And spoiler alert, once again, at that time, Figma did not have the technology it needed to complete this restoration. But we did get a little bit further this time. This time around, Figma gained more conviction that what we needed was a full server-side migration system to get this done. For the engineers in the audience, you know that a server-side migration is the canonical way of mutating data and software. And you can get certain guarantees over the order in which things get migrated and when. We had some idea that this server-side approach could help us run the migration in the right order. We thought maybe, just maybe, this could help us order the nesting dolls. So finally, in 2019, Figma made a third attempt to fix the unflattening problem. Two years had elapsed since we first tried to fix our users' woes with the component system. And this time around, Figma brought together a team that consisted both of engineers who were familiar with Figma's data model 
as well as engineers who were familiar with complex server-side migrations. This team was uniquely powerful, not just because of their shared backgrounds, but also because they were equipped with the pitfalls that the previous two attempts ran into. They knew the limitations of a client-side migration, and they knew when migrations would need to run and in what order. They realized that this would have to happen server-side, and not only that, to accomplish this hairy migration, a new server-side file migration framework would need to be built, one that could take the jumbled mess of unordered files, sort them in order of component dependencies, and spit out orderly migrated files. Now, to be more concrete, this framework was crucial for two reasons. First, it was responsible for ordering the files that would need to be migrated, such that each file containing components was migrated before all the files that contain their instances. Secondly, this framework was also clever enough to migrate changes in multiple scenarios. For example, when an offline client comes back online with pending changes in the old format, it would know to migrate. Once we had this file migration framework, once we had this clean ordering, it was almost as simple as running the original client-side migration logic on each file in order. Finally, in mid-2020, three years after we realized that there were problems with our component data model, Figma completed migrating all of the shared components so that they were unflattened. And in total, Figma had to migrate 78 million versions of components. It was a ton of components. To date, it was one of the most challenging projects that the company has taken on. And in the process, this third team that tackled this problem, they were able to develop a whole system that would help us address similar problems in the future. And now, whenever file data or components decayed, we could reuse this framework to help us restore the data again. So at the end of the day, we've completed this restoration. We were able to preserve the essence and the appearance of every Figma component by rebuilding the physical data behind the component so it was more powerful for our users. When I think about this problem and the way that Figma chose to solve it, what comes to mind first isn't the thousands of hours of work that it took. What comes to mind is why this solution in particular? Why did Figma choose this three-year-long journey? You see, irreversible decisions like this architecture problem with components, they're made every single day in the course of software engineering. It's impossible to know how all of your decisions will snowball over time and impact your users years down the line. But I think it's how we choose to tackle these decisions made by our predecessors that speaks to who we are as an organization. Instead of this full-blown restoration, we could have chosen to leave things as they were for existing design systems. We could have said, hey, we'll create new components in the unflattened version and leave all of the old ones alone and broken. And that would have been a far easier project. We could have done that in like a year, but we didn't do this. Another option would have been to perform the best effort restoration we could have given the resources we had two years ago. We didn't have the file migration framework at the time, but we could have done the best client-side migration that first time around, or even the second. But we also didn't do this. I think the fact that we chose to take on this years-long restoration and build a fully-fledged system around it, well, I think that speaks to some intangible core that exists at Figma. Let's talk about software's intangible core. Obviously, it's really hard to talk about something so intangible, but I do think it shows up in some tangible ways. I think software's intangible core shows up in the process with which you make difficult decisions as a team. It shows up in how you prioritize building over excavating, over restoring. It shows up in how much you invest in making sure that the systems you write are easy to maintain and grow. It shows up in how your products evolve over time. Because software, like Theseus' ship, it's not just about the literal code or the machines that code runs on. Those are simply the artifacts of building. 
Software is about the teams that build them, maintain them, and the ways that they build. Rebuilding this ship of Theseus, this software, it's never going to stop. We're always going to have to go back and revisit the choices that the people who came before us made. Engineering, design, it's never a one and done effort. It's a continuous act of building and restoring, uncovering and learning, and continually renewing the structure of this ship that you've built. With every change that you make, you end up changing the structure that your team is working on. But while you make these changes, you hope that all the while you can preserve that intangible core. Whatever it was that made your product or team or system so unique to begin with, you do what you can to maintain it over the years. I'd like to say thank you to all of these engineers who I mentioned indirectly in this talk who inspire me to care about craft and quality. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you.